Welcome to the Prime Venture Partners Podcast. Today, we are delighted to have with us Hitesh Oberoi, co-founder and CEO of InfoEdge Group. Uh, welcome to the show, Hitesh. Thank you. Thank you for hosting me. Hitesh, I've, I've known you for many years, although we've been a little bit out of touch. Um, you know, you guys are uh, the kind of blockbuster uh, flagship internet company in India. You went IPO, I think, almost 20 years ago. I just had another blockbuster IPO of one of your investee companies, Zomato. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about just the whole internet landscape and how, from your vantage point, it has evolved in the last 20 years? Well, actually, it's almost unrecognizable <laughs> from 20 years ago. 20 years ago, most people didn't even understand what the internet was all about, right? And I remember when we raised money from ICICI Ventures back in 2000, May, there were just 2 million people on the internet, right? Of course, there were no smartphones. And, you know, within a, a month and a half of, of us raising money, uh, you know, there was a big dot-com bust in the US. And in fact, venture capital, which was very new in India at that time, I mean, till 99, and I think most people had not even heard of venture capital. So it was a relatively new thing in India. There were just a handful of VCs. Uh, most of them disappeared from the scene for the next few years, right? And hardly anybody got funded. In fact, we raised uh, one round only. And, you know, luckily for us, we became profitable and we didn't have to raise money again. But the first round we raised also, the money was supposed to come in trenches, right? And in three tranches, in fact, it was just one and a half million dollars, but it was supposed to come in three tranches. Luckily for us, we got our money. ICICI was very kind, but you know, later we discovered that many of the companies which got funded at that time were not able to actually get the entire money even, right? So those were very, very difficult days. Of course, internet penetration was low, and there were no smartphones, and you know, PC penetration in India was low. Nobody expected the Indian internet businesses to become very, very large. And we also had a very different mindset as entrepreneurs, right? We were like. It, I mean, it's okay if you build a small business. I mean, nobody was thinking IPO, nobody was thinking Unicorn, nobody was thinking any of those things at that time. We just wanted to be a good, profitable business. And we had given up our jobs. We have become entrepreneurs for the first time in my family. Something like this had happened and stuff like that, right? So that was a very, very different era. Of course, once uh, Flipkart happened, I think, you know, and uh, then of course we had smartphones and Geo and all that. All these things sort of maybe happened at the same time. I think things changed and things change permanently. Amazing. Um, and, you know, talk to us a little bit about the IPO day. I saw your tweet the other day, which, uh, which got us uh, chatting again uh, privately, which is that, you know, you received more messages for the Zomato IPO, uh, you know, hot off the press than you did for the Nokri IPO back then, uh, even though that was quite a blockbuster event, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. So, see, see we went public in 2006. And actually, that was also... A great time in the sense that the Indian economy was doing really well. I mean, India was growing at nine percent. Uh, but you know, the big story was Indian IT services companies. They were the big daddies of that time. They were all growing at 30, 40 percent. In fact, it would not be wrong to say that we were built on the back of Indian IT services companies and the hiring they were doing at that time. And you know, Infosys, TCS, Wipro, these were the big daddies in those in that time, and they were large and they were super profitable, by the way, right? And they always they always made money. So. So that was a very different era when, in fact, we went public. Uh, we were tiny. Firstly, you know, when we went public, our value, I mean, the market cap of the company was 800 crores, right? right. Even though we were profitable, et cetera, we had been growing at 100% year on year for the last few years. And, you know, our market cap was 800 crores. And uh, most people didn't really understand how to value internet companies, right? So we were benchmarked to IT companies by most analysts. They said, yeah, you are like another TCS or Wipro, so why should you get a multiple which is higher than what TCS and Wipro are getting and, you know, stuff like that, right? So, and we were tiny in comparison to them, right? Not just in revenue, but also in market cap. So that was a very different era. Not many people understood what was really happening. Still, we were one of the, one of the first companies to go public in the internet space in India. There were a couple who had listed on NASDAQ. Uh, and in the US stock exchanges, but they had not done well, right? Uh, so the jury was still out on, you know, whether, I guess, whether we would make it or not and how big we would become and how big the internet would become. Internet penetration had also plateaued in India. It was not growing, you know, rapidly. Uh, so a lot of the theories had not come true, right? And most other companies which were funded along with us had, you know, either folded up or were struggling as well. So I think that was a very different era. I think we were, of course, very excited because we were going public and so on and so forth. Our employees who used to sort of, uh, I mean, and that's like, again, a very different time. Nobody wanted ESOPs at that time. 
<laughs> you know, but we had forcefully given ESOPs to some of them. That yeah, you should take ESOP. No man, who knows what? You know, they were of course very excited because once the company went public. But other than that, there was very little interest in the Indian market and uh, in the in the IPO. Fascinating. And tell us whatever you can about the the uh, about Zomato's IPO, right? Not just the messages, but you know, supremely oversubscribed. You know, we don't have to talk about stock prices or whatever, but. Nonetheless, just the appetite for people to want to participate at a retail institutional, every which way kind of level. It's been amazing. I think it's, uh, you know, of course, see, we were, I mean, Zomato has been through its ups and downs and it's been a, it's a great business, but it's been through its ups and downs and, you know, it still has uh, some way to go. And there is, of course, a lot of competition in that space, but just the sheer excitement around the IPO, I think, um, you know, I think, I don't think anybody expected it, you know. I think it has to do a lot with the fact that Zomato has a is a truly true consumer product. You know, it's used by millions of Indians, especially the millennials. I think they've grown up on ordering from Zomato for the last over the last few years. That's a cult following, you know, amongst that in that audience. So I think that's one. I think the second thing is the social media business, right? Because uh, I think you know, till when we and we IPO, nobody could sort of even message us if they wanted to. It was not easy. They had to pick up what I had to pick up the phone and talk to us and congratulate us and so on, right? Or send an SMS. Today, thanks to Twitter, thanks to you know WhatsApp. I mean, there's a so much sort of discussion and so much conversation around the IPO. You know, so that's I think uh, another. And you know, you and there are there are people who are backing Zomato and there are people who are negative on Zomato. So there are all kinds. But but uh, it's just amazing to see that conversation. And, uh, and of course, uh, you know, even when we went public, by the way, you know, enough people told us you should listen to US and not in India. But here again, you know, because people didn't expect us to get the kind of investors we ultimately managed to get at that time. And even now, I think there was that sort of doubt around whether we, an Indian sort of uh, listing or an Indian stock, the Indian stock market would support a company which is not profitable and so on and so forth. But I think everybody's been proven wrong. And I know it's still early days. It's just been a few days since Zomato went public and it'll take time for the stock to settle down, et cetera. But just the whole energy excitement around it, the startup community also, I think it's maybe a hundred times bigger or a thousand times bigger than it was at that time, right? So there is so much, you know, uh, because I think Zomato has given everybody hope. Listen, that we can also now go public and we can, and there is, there, there is space for us and there are people willing to back us. There are investors willing to back us. There are retail investors willing to back us, not just institutional investors. And uh, I, I think I, I, it's a it's a, a big moment in, in my view. Absolutely, it is definitely a historic moment. And I remember because Mr. Big Chandani was on the board of Make My Trip, where I used to work back when we went IPO on Nasdaq. And I remember some of those conversations. And uh, I remember how euphoric that was when uh, you know Deep and the other founders rang the bell in Nasdaq back in 2010. Late 2010. So, so we'll come back to that in a second. Only thing, only to, thing is, only thing I can say is that we got to ring the bell in the stock exchange physically in 2006 because of COVID. I don't think Zomato was able to. Do that's it. right. <laughs> that's right. This is the work from home era, and we will talk about that as well. Yeah. So, I want to talk about building brands. We'll come back to your investment in Zomato and their own journey and their ups and downs. But you guys also had to kind of fend off against large global competition on an open internet uh, sort of model, right? So whether it was monster.com or LinkedIn or Indeed uh, and, and so on and so forth. And, um, and, 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 and yet you won, right? I mean, I mean, it's always a battle, but nonetheless, uh, I mean, you are a large standalone, profitable, growing company. So can you talk to us a little bit about that uh, in terms of, you know, what were some of the lessons learned, some of the secret sources, maybe some of the, because our, our uh, listeners here are young, early stage entrepreneurs, maybe even growth stage ones now. So, Maybe some lessons and some thoughts from that journey. Yeah, you know, we've always had uh, competition and it's always been global competition for us. And for a while, it's always scared us, right? Because in the early days, we had Monster. Um, and Monster was a big, uh, uh, you know, big global daddy in those days. They were uh, in 32 countries. They were a leader in, all, I think, 28 or 32 of them. And they were, at that point in time, valued at $6 billion. And, you know, they were very profitable and growing and, they came to India uh, very early on. I mean, we just, we raised money just one and a half, two years back and we had not even started sort of, we had not even become a decent business and they were already in India and they acquired the number two player at that time, jobs ahead. And they were very acquisitive. And I think uh, one thing, one call we took at that time was one to not sell to Monster. We said, Nini, yeah, this is something we wanted to build. I mean, like I said, we were not thinking unicorn, we were not thinking valuation. We were just thinking of building a small business for ourselves and 
making it profitable. He said, listen, yeah, what will we do if we sell too much? <laughs> Let's build our business. So that was one call which uh, uh, really nearly went our way. It, it turned out to be the right call in the end. For a while, there was a lot of uh, action and Monster was, like I said, they were aggressive. They were a sales and mar- hardcore sales and marketing company. And they spent a lot of money on advertising. They acquired the number two player. Uh, but luckily for us, some things worked out. We kept growing. We became profitable. We went public. And then in 2008, um, when Lehman uh, hit everybody, I think that uh, in, in, in the short term, we were seriously impacted. You know, our, we were growing at 40% per annum, let's say, before Lehman. Then we went to minus 25% uh, for three quarters after that. But on hindsight, you know, Monster was impacted even more because they were a global company. And they got impacted in every market. And post even we realized that we were actually, you know, it was a good opportunity for us to gain market share. The monster slowed down. And then, then they went through a couple of management changes and so on. And we became a big leader in India by a wide margin. Till then, we were almost like, you know, we were like 5 7% ahead of Monster and so on. And then, but come 2011, 12, we had sort of really sort of, you know, created a big gap between us and them. But then you had LinkedIn and then you had Indeed. Uh, and, you know, I remember in the very early days, uh, Indeed was when it was an independent company, right? It, was, it had not been acquired by Recruit of Japan, which is a very large company in London. Uh, but when they were independent, they were an aggregator. And they had approached us. So because see, the aggregation model was take listings from everywhere and become the largest listing site. And they approached us and we thought very hard about it. And I think one of the best decisions we took at that time was not to give them our listings. Because there was that, that des- you know, there was a temptation to, to get more traffic for free because, you know, that's the, the promise they sort of uh, made. Okay, listen, you know, we'll get traffic and, and you'll get that traffic for free. But I think that was a wise decision because in the end, they got sold to a recruit after a few years and recruit uh, sort of uh, became a traditional, like a traditional job board. They converted indeed into a traditional job board. And luckily for us, we had not, one, we did not give them our listings. Two, we learned from them on how they were getting their traffic from SEO and a few other things which they were doing, which we were not so good at. And uh, so that was, I think, again, in my view, uh, a narrow escape. Because if you had, you know, in our kind of businesses, if you lose even 5, 10, 15 percent share, it can really hurt, you know. Uh, and one of the reasons we get the valuation we get and the reason we get the pricing, the reason we command the pricing we command in market with customers is because we are a clear leader. Right? Uh, and then when LinkedIn happened, you know, again, it was a, a seminal moment because see, LinkedIn was a very different animal. Right? And for a while, we didn't know what, how to react with LinkedIn because they were a networking platform, not a, a listing platform. And we had no answer and we did our, a few things. We tried our hand at networking, et cetera, launched a different brand, it didn't work out. Uh, and then enough people, there were enough noises in the room and they said, maybe Nokri should transform itself into a LinkedIn kind of site. They should, we should become a networking site, et cetera, et cetera. Luckily for us, again, good sense prevailed. And we said, listen, that's not the answer. We can't become a LinkedIn, right? So let's invest in product and technology and improving the user experience on the Nokri platform, right? That was a call we took a few years ago. And then that's how we ramp, started ramping our investments, product technology and user experience on Nokri. And I think it's really worked out for us again. So competition, every time there's competition, there is, uh, you know, the fear of the unknown. But what, I, what we've learned is if you stay the course, you know, sometimes over time, these things go away. Wonderful. You also have a lot of, uh, I don't know if these are all, uh, you know, organic kind of uh, investments in, in various properties, right? Jeevan Sathi and Siksha and so forth, maybe other acquisitions too. So like a big portfolio of companies. Um, and uh, we've talked a little bit about Zomato. We'll come back to the ups and downs of Zomato. What have the learnings been from all of those other investments or, you know, organic or otherwise in terms of, you know, what has scaled, what has not, it, I mean, I don't think it would be disrespectful to say that the parent group, Nokri itself has done incredibly well, right? And now Zomato and the other ones are, I mean, probably done reasonably well, but yeah. they haven't really broken out at sort of mega scale. Yeah. So, you know, uh, hindsight is 2020, but uh, see, I think to start with, what we've realized over time is that there is nothing to be natural traction, right? And, you know, I think now uh, different sort of jargon or terminology is that you have a product market fit, like what is now called product market fit in, in doing our time is to call it traction. Yeah. Does the product have traction? I mean, does it have natural sort of, you know, users, right? It does it sort of, or do we have to market? Do you have to work hard to get, you know, people to sort of discover it or use it? So, and even when we invested in, so Nokri had natural traction because jobs, everybody is looking for jobs. Even the matrimony business we are in, we may not have become a large, it may not have become a large business for us, but it's the category itself is reasonably large in India. It always had traction, right? There was always a demand for matrimony services. And when online happened, you know, people moved to online services from 
print. Uh, if you look at uh, Zomato also, when Zomato first came to us, the product was pretty solid. I mean, we were actually using our product, the product ourselves. You know, Sanjeev and I had been using the product and we liked it. And, and that's why we invested in it because we said, yeah, this looks good. I mean, it's a useful product, right? Uh, so it was getting traffic on its own. Zomato had not raised money. Right? So I think one big thing is, at least for consumer businesses, you know, maybe not so much for B2B is, you know, is does the product have traction? Does it, is there a product market fit? Uh, and it has often to do with timing. And, you know, you hit the market five years early, there is no traction. You hit the five market three years late, there are 20 other players already doing it, right? So timing also becomes important. Uh, the other thing we've seen is that I think it helps if you have, if the founder or the person running the business you know, has a deep understanding of the space, right? If he has clarity on how this thing is going to play out, you know, uh, in his or her head, right? I think that's very important. And, I, and and this is where I think Policy Bazaar is, you know, why we invest in Policy Bazaar uh, is because when we met the founder, even though he was a classmate and many other things, but uh, he had seen the space play out in England, in, in, in UK. And when he came to us, we it felt like this guy has complete clarity yeah, on how this thing is going to play out over the next 10 years. Yeah, sure, there will be challenges, execution challenges, regulatory challenges. But, uh, you know, they, the guy had clarity, right? Uh, so it helps, I think, if the person running this show, you may call it vision, you may call it whatever, has clarity on how things will uh, play out over the next few years. Because what happens as a result of that is you make fewer mistakes. You're not struggling to figure out things as you go along. Uh, and then the other things we've learned and some things which we have not been very good at, by the way, ourselves as a company, but I've seen some of our investing companies do a better job than us, is their ability to take quick decisions, course correct, and things don't work out, to take action, you know, shut down something, open something, pivot, you know, much faster than we are able to do uh, as, as a company. Uh, so now, in addition to this, I think, you know, if you want to build a large business size with the addressable opportunity also, matters and a few other things matter and the ability of the founder or the business head to attract and retain talent and build a good team some of these things of course matter a lot uh, but in the end yeah you know your product has to be unique your product has to be relevant and has to be scalable absolutely absolutely um, so any any so as you're looking to invest now right from your balance sheet and you have made investments uh, like you mentioned in several companies already and and more what is it that you guys typically look for? Is it mostly kind of financial returns? Are there sort of some intent to be like a strategic investor, maybe a potential future acquirer? Um, and, uh, you know, beyond these things that you summarize, right? Natural traction, yeah. founder clarity. Are there other things you look for in investments you make? Yeah. So see, when we started investing outside, you know, we invested, we were investing mostly from a balance sheet. And the idea was to make strategic investments, meaning not... Uh, uh, you know, strategic growth businesses necessarily, as in not adjacent to our businesses necessarily, but to own and more, own more and more of the companies we were investing in over time, right? But this was a very different era. This is pre Flipkart, <laughs> you know, when the number of internet users were few, uh, were few, and we thought we, you know, a company could be built with three, four, five million dollars because Nokia was built with one and a half million dollars. So that was a different era. So that's how it all started. Uh, but over time, we realized that the check size was becoming larger. And we didn't have the financial sort of muscle to cut $100 million, $200 million checks. And therefore, you know, the, you know, we sort of willy-nilly had to let other investors in, right? Because we wanted the companies to succeed. And over time, all the other, in, these investments we were making, whether in Zomato or Policy Bazaar or the 20 others we made over time became financial investments, right? Uh, it took us some, a while to sort of digest it, realize it. You know, for a while, there was a lull. We didn't invest in too many companies also because... Uh, you know, just the, just the valuations were too much for us, right? And then we took note and, and then we realized what well, this is here to stay. And then we changed track. You know, we changed our strategy. And today, you know, the way we look at it is we do acquisitions, right? So that's one bucket. We, you know, acquisitions in, in areas which we already have a business in, jobs, real estate, matrimony, education. So in these areas, we acquire startups. We've acquired maybe five or six companies over the last three, four years, uh, five years. Two, we have a fund which we have set up for making financial investments. So now the financial investments are rooted through a fund, an AIF, right, in which we have uh, put in some money. And that AIF has its own partners and they run the fund, right? And then we also do some strategic investments from our balance sheet, which are again mostly in the areas in which we have a business. 
an operating business. And here we maybe go into these companies early, we take a significant chunk and the goal is to acquire own more and more of the company over time. But again, you know, this we've been doing for the last two, three years and the learning is that companies change, right? So you may invest in something or thinking that they're going to build something, but you know, companies, especially in the early sort of days, you know, their model changes, they pivot, they enter new areas and that is hard for you to predict. Uh, so, so it's very possible that some of these strategic investments or may also turn out to be financial over time, who knows, right? Uh, but we, we like to do all types, even now. No, we're, we're very glad you do. I think we need, uh, India needs all the capital it can, and, and certainly large companies like you also need to be good acquirers, right? So it's good to see, uh, you know, you guys acquire, now the Tatas are beginning to do it, the Reliance, of course, the global guys are always doing it, right? Like the Googles yeah. and Facebooks and Twitters of the world. Uh, so I think it's good to see large Indian internet giants uh, begin to do that too, or, or even other conglomerates. Um, any any specific things you look for in terms of the founder or, uh, you know, the market addressable and otherwise, I mean, we've talked about some of these already, but any nuanced things that you look for that uh, that has helped you as, as you make your decisions? So see, normally we like to back, uh, see what we've understood over time is that it takes at least eight, 10 years to get anywhere in India, right, to build a business. So we like to back people who are in it for the long run. Right, number one. Number two, like I said, we like to back people, uh, you know, who, of course, integrity is a given. I mean, it can't be, you know, you don't want to back teams that are where you have doubts, right? Number three, uh, like I said, you know, you want to back a team which has a good idea, which sort, seems like a good idea to you. So we don't have very a top down approach. Okay, listen, we want to take one company in financial payments, one company in e commerce. That's not how we work. We go bottom up, right? We see what's bubbling up. We see the quality of the entrepreneur, the quality of the founding team. Right? What is their idea? What is that insight they have? Right? Uh, and then, of course, we apply our knowledge of our understanding of the Indian market, our understanding of the Indian consumer, our understanding of how large the sort of company can become in India to that. And then we say, okay, this, it looks like it could become a decent business. Right? And it looks like these guys will build a moat in the business. Right? It, they will build, they, they, they are onto something which, if they get right, it will be hard for others to enter. It will be hard, hard for others to compete with them. Right? I think that's an important one uh, in my books. Uh, you know, uh, you know uh, see, what we've realized in Nokri also is that there are some modes that are hard to build, right? And there are some which are, kids can be easily be sort of. So, so I think where, I think, so this is an important one. Where we think, yeah, the business could have serious competitive advantages over time once it sort of becomes successful. Uh, we like that, right? The last thing we also keep in mind is that, see, like I said, we are not, we don't have hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars to invest. So if it looks like the business is going to be very, very capital intensive from day one, then we would rather stay with it, right? But having said that, things are now beginning to change uh, because the market has deepened. There are many more investors in the market. There are enough companies who are willing to invest, who invest with you today. That was the case five years ago, 10 years ago. Uh, so some of these things might change. Earlier, we used to restrict ourselves to only Indian companies, only companies targeting the Indian market, only companies targeting consumer internet because that's what we understood best, right? But now that we've added more people to our, uh, you know, investing team, they brought in new skills. We are willing to go a little bit outside the box as well uh, compared to earlier. But ultimately, you're backing the founding team and the idea, and that has to give you confidence. Absolutely. Well, that's the business that we are in at Prime Ventures as yeah. well, and probably a very similar playbook. We look at differentiation at entry and defensibility over time. We look for capital efficiency as an early stage fund. So, yeah. so lots of things. So hopefully we can do things together uh, as InfoEdge and, and Prime over time. Uh, so we'll, we've got to get that account going. Um, switching gears, since you also said, you know, you know, you do things bottoms up, what are, what are you seeing as bubbling up or things that you think will be interesting? I, I don't mean specific companies, but any kind of trends or ideas or categories that you see like is bubbling up a lot in your mind uh, or as, as you guys see uh, for prospective investment? So I think there's been a sea change in the last uh, uh, 24 months, you know, and maybe maybe COVID has sort of accelerated whatever is already happening in, in the economy. Uh, but right now, I think there is action everywhere on every front. So earlier it used to be, okay, e-commerce, then fintech, then this, then that, you know. Now it seems to be every sector of the economy is ripe for disruption. Right, there is action in health tech. There's action in ed tech. There's action in ad tech, sales tech, HR tech, whatever tech. You know, everything has a tech element to it, and everything is up for disruption. 
Uh, how many of these companies will be successful? I don't know. But clearly, for example, uh, we, see our, we are seeing a lot of companies in education. Right, because something you know we do shiksha so some of these companies come to us also so clearly we are seeing a lot of companies in, in, in education um, uh, unlike two years ago um, uh, clearly you know uh, you know even in hr we are seeing a lot more companies in it right because again that's a space we sort of operate in uh, other than that i think if, you are, if i if you look at our ai we've been making all kinds of investments yeah logistics companies fintech companies you know uh, other, uh, and then there are all kinds of options see the other thing is there are all kinds of deals now in the market you can do pre-IPO round, you can do series A, series B round, you can do early stage. It's a very much more structured market than it was uh, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, right? So you have all kinds of, then you have companies going international, you know, so those kind of companies. Then there are deep tech companies. But deep tech is another thing which is bubbling up now. Now, I don't know how much time these companies will take to become large, but clearly there is, that's an emerging sort of, uh, there's a lot of action in that area, right? Um, uh, so, so, so I think EVs is another area where there is uh, uh, a lot of action now, right? Uh, so my sense is, my sense is, see, technology. Uh, see, what I've also noticed over time, you know, is that every time there's a new technology, it opens up opportunities for entrepreneurship and disruption. So the internet was hot technology 25 years ago, 30 years ago, and then you had, you know, a bunch of other things happening over time. Then you had social media, you had smartphones, and AI and machine learning. For all you know, over the next 10 years, you know, we're going to see maybe another three or four very hot new emerging technologies, which will open up opportunities to disrupt everything out there, right? So my sense is this is only going to accelerate. This is only going to get worse in that sense, right? Or, and, or, or and, better. Uh, yeah, in or better, way. yeah, or better, depending on which side of the <laughs> equation you are on, right? Uh, but, but there's action everywhere. Great. Um, switching gears, let's talk about talent and, and, you know, the scarcity of talent globally uh, in tech, since like you're saying, everything is tech now, right? Asterix tech. Um, and in particular in India as well. I mean, the, the inflation of some of the salaries for tech engineers, not just in AI and ML, but pretty much even a React developer, everybody. And now with all these monster rounds and monster IPOs, it's going to get worse. So so if you are a young entrepreneur today building a tech something startup and need to go hire 10, 15, 20 uh, engineers or, or more, what would you recommend? Because you have some access to data that the rest of us don't, perhaps, right? And uh, how should one think about it? And what can we do both at an entrepreneurial level for people who are wanting to build companies, but maybe even a little bit at a policy and a sort of uh, government and an industry level? Yeah, see, it's a tough one. See, I don't think I've seen a hotter talent market for tech in the last 15 years. So, you know, the early 2000s were hot uh, because of IT services, like I said. Uh, this is a different level of hotness in the tech market, right? And unfortunately, fortunately, it's coincided with COVID. So it's not as if the economy is doing well. You know, the economy is still struggling. I mean, there are parts of the economy which are like below what they were in three years ago, you know. And then you have this hot talent market, which has created its own problems, uh, problem for companies, right? And, you know, I was just reading the other day that it's coincided with the number of engineering seats going down in the country, right? So what happened in India was that because of an IT services boom in the 2000s, thousands of engineering colleges were set up to cater to that boom, right? And many of those guys got employment, they got placed, et cetera, et cetera. So over time, the number of seats kept going up and up and up. So, uh, and then, you know, the IT services companies started slowing down and it took a while for, you know, the education market to correct. And because, you know, hiring was not so for the last few years, right, a lot of these colleges shut down and the number of seats actually came down, went down. And now we're in a market which is a hot market once again, and it's coinciding with the number of engineering seats going down in the country, right? So what should we do? Uh, what should one do? See, one is, of course, from a startup point standpoint, see, startups don't need too many people, right? Every, I mean, uh, so they, every startup needs maybe 5, 10, 20, 30, 40 engineers. So they, frankly, not just startups, but even companies like ours need to work very, very hard to retain our top talent. Right? So retention is the first thing. Listen, in a market where it's impossible to hire, you have to retain whatever you have, right? So you throw whatever you can at the problem. You know, if you are a startup, you have a lot of stock to throw at it. If you're a cashless company, you can throw a lot of cash, right? Somewhere in the middle, you throw both, right? So I think you would, whatever currency you are sort of rich in, you sort of throw at the problem because that's what you have. And that's what others will find hard to replicate and hard to beat you at, right? So, but retention becomes very, very important. 
बिकॉज इन टेक वी सीन यार यू लूज समबडी so the stakes are very high uh, especially for startups and therefore they have to throw whatever they are rich in at the problem number one uh number thing the other companies i think the bigger slightly bigger players i, th- I think need to do what the it services companies uh, did in the early 2000s yeah you know initially they used to go to iits and hire computer science engineers then they relaxed it they said okay any engineer from any iit will do then they said yeah let's go to the tier 2 institutes and hire computer science engineers then they said yeah we'll go to the tier 2 institute hire any engineer then they started hiring bscs also but then what they did was they invested massively in training and onboarding and you know in many cases unlearning and relearning <laughs> you know because indian education being what it is right now uh, so they did that and they were very successful at it so i think bigger companies need to sort of maybe grow the talent market a little bit right work work hard at sort of growing the talent market uh, if the if all of us continue to hire only from iits and nits there's only that much talent out there yeah there is no way that we can uh, you know grow our companies like that so i think we will have to work harder spread the net wider get more people in maybe be patient with them train them a little bit three you know this remote for work remote work opens up new opportunities yeah so i think you know maybe companies will have to be a little more flexible on this this front as well uh, to attract talent now long run i don't know yaar i mean what can the government do I don't know whether the government will do anything. <laughs> What the government is saying is, listen, we have freed up education. You know, there's EdTech. You know, we have a new education policy. We've already done whatever we could. I'll figure it out. And I think it opens up new opportunities also because uh, the old system is also dying. You know, because all said and done, while there are five thousand engineering or four thousand engineering colleges, the quality of education is horrible at most places, right? So they graduate whatever six, eight, like nine lakh engineers every year, but only a handful are employed. Right? That's been the number one complaint on Nokri from all our customers from day one for all jobs. Listen, we have a lot of people, but they don't have the right skills, right? So if you know these edtech companies, you know are more connected to industry and they can help train people with the right skills early on, so that they don't have to wait for that engineering degree and then you know again learn and becomes a five-year process. If that moves and that becomes, you know, you start learning what you what the industry needs from day one. online and then you go back and learn again if required right and that is i think already happening as we speak it's just i hope it just accelerates going forward so that could again help in the medium term i i can't but help plug in one of our investee companies called sunstone adversity so they are exactly in this business of course they're focusing more on business school right so mbas and bbas and so forth but they literally make you job ready that's the whole curriculum right yeah. so you the day you graduate they're going to get several jobs and uh, and and they're getting infinite amount of demand from both sides from the employers as well as from the yeah. student community but for that reason i think we have to get more accountability in education that way right yeah. so uh, that's the only way to think about it see if you spend 4 years you don't earn for that period then you spend on education then in half the case what you learned is not relevant <laughs> right and then you go back and learn again it's very inefficient So, so let me double click on that a little bit more. I want to. I do want to come back to the talent market, but is credentialing as we've always known it, right? You know, went to IIT, went to IIM, went to whatever, uh, you know, NIT, etc. Is that kind of dead? Not not in the classical sense. Obviously, if you went to IIT, there is some sort of pedigree attached to that. But is it now going to be more skill based, knowledge based, learning based thing? And are you seeing that even in on on the Nokri platform? Like our employers asking you for ability to screen that way as opposed to this person went to iit and graduated in 2008 and so on and so forth right saying ki wo sab to theek hai tell me like how good are they at python or tell me how good are they at this like can you bring all of that out that doesn't matter even if they didn't go to a fancy college or even are a college dropout are you seeing that or is too early here uh, so far no i think it's beginning to happen and this is one reason we are why we acquired a talent assessment platform which we call do select right because enough companies uh, you know for example even if the person has been to a good college they want to do some sort of tests they want to some run, run some sort of tests and uh, especially if a person has is not pedigreed so to speak it's, it's not from a good college or has not has not worked for a good company they want to be doubly sure right and therefore they are investing in running you know these assessments online it's become easier also with all these platforms right uh 
And what we've seen over time is that whenever the market heats up, the demand for such things go up, increase. Because see, when the market is not hot, you know, you go to your regular colleges, you get whatever you want and you train them, right? But when the market heats up, uh, what, do you want to pay 50% more, 100% more? Or would you rather do the hard work of figuring out uh, some of the smarter people or the best amongst the rest, you know, like some people call say. So I think if the talent market continues to be hot for the next few years, then this will only increase, right? Now, if it's a short-term thing, what we are seeing with the short-term phenomena, if it's not sustainable, if, you know, demand crashes after a year, it is very likely that companies will go back to how they were hiring that position, right? Having said so, see, the demand for top talent from top universities will remain because there's a lot of, uh, like you said, the credential, you know, there's a lot of signaling in that, right? That you know that you're hiring somebody uh, who's like top notch when it comes to academics, who's sort of, you know, has worked hard all his life, who's very bright. So those sort of, there's a signaling, signaling value there. And, 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 you know, and when students also go to these colleges, they get a lot more in terms of experience and exposure than just academics, right? Uh, which I think is great for them in the long run. So it may so happen that you end up with a market after a while where the big schools actually get bigger, you know, and they actually move, then they even move online. And then you have the big education online companies who are skilling a lot of people on the go every year. And the other colleges, et cetera, disappear. Very likely. Makes sense. Uh, just going back one quick question on that. Are you seeing new hotbeds of talent geographically? I know there's the work from home, which is anywhere, but you know, cities like uh, Jaipur or a Baroda or a Aurangabad or some such, like, are you seeing talent density pop up, pop up or it's, it, it's really still the big places and then it's all, all the same. Uh, well, it's mostly uh, still the big places, right? And uh, it's mostly still Delhi, Bombay, Bangalore, Chennai, Hyderabad, Pune, right? The, now there are, Within these big places also, if you want top tech talent, you go to Bangalore. If you want sales talent, it's more available elsewhere, right? Within these sort of, if you want high quality business talent, often it is available. If you want financial talent, you go to Bombay, right? So within these cities also, there are nuances and there are differences. Uh, some small cities have good talent, but you know, the numbers are still very small, right? So like, you know, if you want good finance talent, CAs, et cetera, you go to Jaipur, you'll get them in Rajasthan, right? Uh, you know, uh, you want street smart talent, you get them, you get some guys in Gujarat, right? You know, so there are some pockets like that, but still very tiny, not, I mean, not significant in my, it's still the big cities. Great, Hitesh. Uh, so as we sort of, uh, you know, uh, bring this to kind of a close, uh, what would you, I mean, this is a personal question for you, uh, you know, the Hitesh in 2021 advise the Hitesh of 20 years ago or 15 years ago, right? What would you I mean, you by all means had a blockbuster, successful entrepreneurship and otherwise sort of uh, impact. What would you advise yourself from 20 years ago? If I look back and like I, like I said, hindsight is 2020, we have always underestimated how big things could become and how much things could change in the long run. Starting with the size of the market, when we first wrote the business plan for ICICI, we said we will do 20 crores in five years. They said, listen, this is not aggressive enough. We said we can't even think of doing 20 crores. We are doing... 30 lakhs a year right now, right? So we don't think the market is at large, oh. right? And like I said, you know, we were IPOing in 2006, within six years of raising money, right? So, you know, so we have, I think, for some reason, always underestimated many things, how much things could change in the long run. Maybe that's our DNA, maybe that's how we think. Uh, we have also overestimated how much things would change in the short, short run. So every time there was a big competitor, we would worry, worry a lot. And, you know, like I said, things blow over if you just stay, stay the course and keep doing what you're doing. But if I look back, see, we were frugal, we were starved of capital. There was not much capital available in those days. The kind of ecosystem which exists today, the kind of funding which is available today was not available then. So we were very conservative. You know, we were we over-invested in sales, under-invested in product and technology for the longest time. Of course, talent was also not easily available. So if I were to look back, you know, and what, what, what would I do differently? One, invest more in product and technology invest early, right? And spend more time to understand new trends because we've seen every time there's a new trend, it changes the game, 
And if you're able to ride the trend, it benefits you. If you are not able to understand the trend, it hurts you. Trends meaning mobile, for example, social media, right? Uh, you know, AI and machine learning, right? It takes time sometimes to figure these things out, but you have to invest, right? You have to invest early. And at that time, talent is not available. You also don't fully understand. You don't fully appreciate. You make mistakes, all that happens, but you have to do it, right? And you have to be aggressive about it. The third thing, you know, uh, again, you know, we made mistakes, uh, we understood late. And like I said, you know, technology sort of seen is changing rapidly. Right? So you have to continuously infuse new talent into the company at all levels, right? In all areas, right? So don't do that. If you, you know, become lax about it, if you say, listen, we know it all, our guys know it all, or the company culture becomes such that it's hard for new people to come in and sort of get assimilated into the company and make a difference, doesn't work, yeah. So that's something, again, we've learned over time. So these are the three of, and you know, you have to believe that the market is larger than you think, and that you're only limited by your imagination, right? Because if you, have, if you don't think like that, you will become very, very conservative. And I'd like, I said, what we've learned the hard way in India is that, you know, India surprises, yeah, you know, it, it's not China, but it's not, uh, you know, uh, uh, Africa either. So, you know, it's, it's you know, it, it, you know, somewhere in the middle. And, you know, uh, if you become very conservative on China or India, that's not a good thing. You become, I don't know whether we should become over aggressive in India, but that's what it seems to be working right now. Absolutely. Who knows? 10 years from now, somebody yeah. listening to this might be like, they, they weren't thinking big enough, even though they were talking <laughs> exactly. about it. So exactly. we are probably underestimating it in the long term and maybe overestimating it in the short term. I love that. So, so with that, we'll bring it to a close. Thank you so much, Hitesh, for being on the Prime Venture Partners podcast. It was a delight to have you. I have many more questions, but we'll uh, call it a wrap. Thanks again for being on the show. Thank you, Amit. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. Dear listeners, thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. Subscribe now on your favorite podcast app for free and you'll be the first one to know when new episodes are available. Just search for Prime Venture Partners Podcast in Apple Podcast, Spotify, CastBox or however you get your podcasts. Then hit subscribe. And if you have enjoyed the show, we would be really grateful if you leave us a review on Apple Podcast. To read the full transcript, find the link in the show notes.